Okay, it looks like most people are in. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you allowing us the opportunity to answer some questions regarding the virtual delivery of the 2022 specialty certifying examination. I'm Dr. Dina Dinas. I'm the Director of Assessment Development and Delivery here at ABOG. And today I'm joined by Dr. Pooja Shivraj, the Chief of Psychometrics and Research, Dr. Barbara Hoffman, the Assistant Executive Director of Assessment, <clears throat> Mr. Kirk. Diepenbrock, the Chief Information Officer, and Dr. George Wendell, Executive Director. One note before we get started, this webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent to all candidates by the end of the day today. I'll, and at the end of the week, you will receive a candidate manual and the frequently asked questions we generate from our webinar. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Wendell to share his opening remarks. Great, thank you, Dr. Dinas. I'd just like to welcome you all and uh, appreciate all that you're doing right now in these trying times in our country, both related to COVID-19 um, and to some of the issues regarding uh, reproductive health care and abortion. Uh, we appreciate everything you're doing for caring for your patients, and we hope to provide some useful information for you today that will help you understand uh, some of the changes that we've made uh, for the exams coming up this year. I do want to add a, a little bit of context that some of our questions or some of your questions may not get some answers that you may be asking. Uh, many of you know that we have been recently sued by the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons in federal court with several other boards. And we've also had threatening emails from other organizations uh, with accusations against us. And you can look those up too, if you're interested. Both of these are publicly available, both the federal lawsuit and the threatening uh, note that came from the uh, uh, Ape Log Association. So under legal counsel, we may not be able to answer some of the questions that you may have, and I apologize for that in advance. I'll turn things back over to you, Dr. Dinas. Thank you, sir. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of notes. Uh, this, the chat functionality is disabled during this webinar. Please utilize the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen to ask the questions that you have. We'll answer them in the order that they're received at the end of the webinar, and then we will compose a frequently asked questions document from the questions asked today. Um, and, and for those that have been submitted ahead of time. Um, so with those logistics covered, let's jump into the specifics of the specialty certifying examination administration. Our, as you know, our decision to move to a remote format for the 2022 certifying exam has no impact on the previously published dates of the exam. At this point, everyone on this webinar should know your exam week, if not yet your exam date. You will be notified of your exam date approximately four to six weeks before your exam week. We're working on that information right now. In order to accommodate all time zones, testing remotely, we've revised our exam day schedule as follows. Please note that all times are central standard time. There will be a 30 minute registration period. We'll talk a little bit more about that in subsequent slides. Please note registration may or may not take that entire 30 minutes. Each of your testing sessions, office practice, obstetrics and gynecology will be an hour, each with 10 minute breaks in between. You will have a different set of examiners for each session. The checkout time is slated to take approximately 15 minutes Please take this schedule into consideration as you are planning for your exam day. And then here are the afternoon sessions. If you have requested a lactation or any other type of accommodation, there will be specifics in the candidate manual that will be emailed to you later this week that will address your specific exam day schedule. For each session, your hour will be divided into 30 minute time blocks. The first 30 minutes, whether you are in office practice, obstetrics, or gynecology sessions, will focus on structured cases shared with you by your examiners via Zoom. The second half of the hour will focus on your case lists. Examin examiners will share specifics with you via Zoom. 
Now our Chief Information Officer, Mr. Kirk Dippenbrock, will outline the technical requirements for our remote exam administration. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dinas. Um, just going to go over some technical requirements for the machine that you're going to use for the exam. Um, your operating system requirements are below, Windows 10 or higher, Mac OS 10.11 um, or higher. Um, audio and video, you'll need working speakers or a headset, a working microphone, and a webcam. Internet connection speed, uh, we've now gotten a, a good amount of experience and feedback on this. Uh, we suggest that you be at 40 megabits or higher. Um, you can test this yourself by going to fast.com or any other speed test that you'd like to go to. The reason we use fast.com is it's easy to remember. Your screen resolution uh, for purposes of the exam needs to be 1280 by 720 or higher. And please keep your computer plugged into a power source so that it doesn't stop working partway through the exam. We'll be using Zoom to deliver the application. Um, for those of you who don't know, Zoom typically does their updates on Sunday. So it'd be a good idea for you to go and check your Zoom client and make sure that it's up to date um, Sunday evening or early Monday morning. Tablet devices or phones um, may not be used to participate in the certifying exam. I wanna say those words explicitly there. Um, they simply do not possess the, the right uh, equipment to uh, give a good experience. The ideal, technically, the ideals are that you have an external monitor with a larger screen so that you're not working from a laptop and again, constrained uh, by the uh, definition on those screens. Um, if you're using an external monitor with laptop, laptop must be closed. You're only allowed to have one screen open. Uh, a headset with microphone is preferred, but you can use speakers um, and a a webcam. The one thing we discourage is use of Bluetooth earbuds. Um, the reason that for that is that there is some lag um, that is very distracting for the exam. If you have an internal, you can use an internal, but we prefer an external high def camera. And at least uh, we have a little discrepancy there. Um, so at least 1280 by 720 resolution, but ideally 1920 by 1080. Prior to the exam um, and going out today will be a link to do ABOG tech checks. Um, you will be required to have approximately a five to 15 minute meeting with one of our technicians um, looking to make sure that your environment meets these specifications. Um, if they do not, or we have trouble meeting them, then you'll be referred to ABOG's IT staff uh, to further work through the issue. So some specifics about things you need to do prior to the examination. In mid-September, an orientation video providing you with even more specific information about the structure of the exam and the specifics of exam day will be available for you on your ABOG portal. You will receive an email when the videos are ready. There's a set of three really quick, someplace between two and six minute videos, as well as an orientation video prepared for you by Dr. Hoffman with specifics around the exam. Uh, additionally, as you approach your exam day, you will need to sign the ABOG terms of agreement. These will be posted as a task on your portal and you may view them now in their entirety if you choose to in the 2022 Specialty Certifying Exam Bulletin available on the ABOG website. I know many of you have spent plenty of time in that document. Prior to the exam, about one week from your exam day, you will receive a Zoom link, uh, a suggestion. Please either flag that or create a folder so that that email is readily accessible and that Zoom link is there for you on your testing day. 
You will also need to print a copy of your case list from the case list entry system. Click on the cases tab and on the next screen, select the section you want to print. A reminder that you want to select the de-identified copy. Please note you need to print all three sections. On exam day, you'll need to bring the printed copy of your case list. You may not make notes on it and examiners may ask to see your list as part of the check-in process. Again, during the second half hour of each session, examiners will focus on your case list. The first half hour of each session will be structured cases. Now, Dr. Shivraj is going to discuss what will happen after the exam. Thank you, Dr. Dinas. Okay, so after the exam, you will be asked to fill out a post survey on the process. The reason this is important is because all of the information that Dr. Dinas has provided you and, Dr. and Mr. Diepenbrock has provided you, we've collected all of this information after the prior virtual examinations that we have given from candidates like you. Um, and they have let us know what is important to them in this entire process. So um, we've created these training videos and things like that based on what they feel is necessary. And so if you give us that information after your exam, it would be valuable to us as well. And so we'll send you that link right after your exam. Exam results will be released six weeks from the Friday of the exam week. So even if you take it on Monday or Tuesday, it will be released the Friday um, from the exam week, six weeks after using our exam scoring model that we've used since last year. Um, you will receive an email when your results are posted. Um, just a little bit about our scoring model. Um, we implemented it last year um, and um, it increases fairness for candidates. It's a psychometric model called the multifacet Roche model. Um, candidates are graded during the exam on both their structured cases and their case lists by their examiners on all three sections. And this model accounts for examiner severity and case difficulty when calculating um, your scores from your grades that are received by examiners. You can find more information about the model on our website, and we do provide more information when you receive your school reports that are posted on your portal once you get your um, grades that you'll receive six weeks later. Um, how your score is determined based on the cut score, if your score is greater than or equal to the actual cut score, um, you pass. Um, we do account for a confidence interval as well when we do um, take into account whether you pass or fail. The reason it takes six weeks to actually post results is it requires analysis of um, fairness, the examiner's severity, and the case difficulty. So it's not just based on the grades that you receive. We take into account the entire week's worth of scores and then take into account the examiner's severity as well. Um, this model has been used since 2021, last year, for both the subspecialties and the specialties. We have done statistical analysis to compare whether there has been differences in pass rates from the prior years, and there has been no statistically significant differences in pass rates. So the model has worked well for us. Um, don't think there's any more, are there questions? So um, in monitoring the Q&A, we have a question, um, and Mr. Dippenbrock, I'm gonna send this to you. Is it okay to wear AirPods? I know you addressed it a little bit, but you might want to elaborate on that. Uh, I discourage um, any type of Bluetooth um, microphone or um, earbud-like technology. Um, they've actually accounted for a majority of the problems that we've had uh, when it comes to um, hearing, um, being able to hear during the exam process. So I would highly discourage that. Um, I'd go with some type of um, USB or auxiliary plug-in wired headset. Can I add one more comment to that? 
in our last examination, there were two people that actually ran out of battery with their AirPods. Um, and so that was also an issue we faced. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is about how a lactation accommodation can be requested. That is detailed for you in the CE bulletin. I would encourage you to go out and make that request as soon as possible. We realize that um, most people have already made those requests, but certainly we want to accommodate our um, nursing moms who might need that information. So please go out to the bulletin for that information. I do see that we've got a couple of people who have raised their hand. I need you to go ahead and go into the Q&A portion and put your questions there. We are going to be generating a frequently asked question list for this webinar. Uh, there's a question, Dr. Shivraj, for you. If there's no difference in pass rates with the new scoring model, why is the new scoring model needed? It seems as if it only serves to delay the score reporting. That is a great question. Um, the new scoring model accounts for, so it serves you as candidates, not us, um, in terms of accounting for examiner severity and case difficulty. So if you are thinking about um, Dr. Dinas facing two examiners who are super harsh in one room and going through three rooms and those examiners that are just really difficult examiners and Dr. Hoffman who goes to another room and are facing three examiners that are really easy. As an aggregate, the pass rates might not change, but if she's going through three rooms that um, and she passes as a candidate, but Dr. Dinas goes through three rooms and she fails because of that. Those two candidates have two separate experiences. As an aggregate, the pass rate might not change and there might be no statistical, sig statistically significant differences, but those two candidates, Dr. Dinas and Dr. Hoffman, now have two separate experiences. And so for candidate fairness, we're now accounting for them to serve our candidates. Does that make, I'm hoping that makes sense. Yeah, I would just like to highlight that with the fact that the old scoring system used to give a grade of pass, fail, or borderline. And the new scoring system has changed that to a, a scaled score that doesn't say pass or fail or borderline. That's a big step forward too. There aren't those kind of judgments being made on, on answers to questions nor on patient management. Um, is that a fair statement? And I, I think although the other scores came out quicker, I think the standard for being fair and having reliable valid tests has changed and we really are meeting a higher standard now than we were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, I will let our physician executives answer this question. Is there a dress code during the test? There's um, no specific dress, uh, dress code, but um, we want you to present yourself in the best positive light. So, um, I think a professional appearance um, makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. There are several questions in regards to the setup for the room that you may be using for testing. Those will be addressed really in depth in the candidate manual, but uh, some of the, the specifics, you do need to de-identify um, your room, I guess. So taking your diplomas, um, anything that might show where you are or where you work, where you've trained needs to come off of the walls. You may, um, you need to remove any reference materials, books, et cetera, that might be on your desk or in proximity to you during the exam. There will be a process for um, as you check in as part of that registration process on your either testing morning or afternoon, there will be a process for you to show your field. And um, that will be again explained in deeper depth in the candidate manual. Uh, there is a question about a virtual background. So I'm gonna go ahead and address that since 
it kind of goes with the same thing. Virtual backgrounds are not allowed during the testing process. Let's see. Make sure that I get this. Mr. Dibbenbrock, um, for the ABOG IT check that is required, do we need to bring the computer to a specific location? No, you do not. Uh, we would like you to uh, take it, uh, do the tech check in the environment you plan to take the exam in. Um, if that doesn't work from a technical standpoint, um, then you know you may be asked to move around, get closer to the router, get closer to a, a Wi-Fi hub, um, something like that. There's also a question about if you plan to take the test in a room that has other monitors, i.e. a home office, what's best practice there, sir? We are going to ask you, unfortunately, to disconnect those. Um, we only want one, uh, one display uh, to be able to work at that time. I, I can appreciate that at my house, I'd have to do some work too, um, but we do request that you just have one working monitor. Thank you. There's a question about opti um, opting out of a lactation accommodation. Uh, if someone has recently stopped breastfeeding, if you'll just email exams at abog.org, we will address that accommodation request or no longer having a need for it. Dr. Shivraj, this one's for you. What goes into the scoring on the case list? Um, the case list is scored similarly to the structured cases. It is on a four-point scale, um, and it's given an overall grade. Thank you for that. Dr. Hoffman, for pap smear guidelines, can we refer to the ASCCP mobile app? Uh, in your description of tools that you use in your practice, you can certainly verbally refer to the app. Um, it would not be a tool that you could use during the exam. The cases are structured so that um, the broad and overreaching concepts of screening and management of, a, of cervical dysplasia is incorporated in the exam answers rather than specific mobile app replies. Thank you. Uh, there's a question about what you're allowed to do during your break time, that brief 10 minutes between sessions. Um, you are not allowed to use your phone. Specifically, you are not allowed to access the internet through your phone, another computer, and your watch, all of those things are off limits during the exam administration. Essentially, you need to use that time to take whatever biology breaks you might need, whether that's going to the restroom, getting a drink of water, or whatever your um, beverage of choice is for the exam administration. And then you need to be back in the room approximately five minutes before your exam starts, the next session starts. So it's not a lot of time. Uh, there's a question about whether this will be available to view. Great question. Uh, it's being recorded right now and we'll be sending out to everyone this recording this afternoon. And then there will be an another version uploaded to YouTube later this week that it will be available, um, I guess, in perpetuity. Um, so yes, you will have that opportunity. Um, Dr. Shivraj, what determines the severity of the examiners in the grading of the exam? Um, it's a, so I can give an entire lecture on this, but in short, it's a, um, a psychometric model, the multifaceted Roche model. So it's not us internally that determines um, the severity of examiners. It's a model that takes into account all examiners of the week and then places them on the scale based on how they grade candidates on each of the cases. And so that determines severity of examiners. Um, a point of clarification that I'm seeing in the questions for the ABOG IT check, is it required that you need to bring your computer to a specific location? No, this is not a, um, 
physically you will be in your space where you are taking the exam and we have support for you as we look at all of the operation systems necessary for a successful administration. Is there anything you would want to add to that, Mr. Dippenbrock? No, you covered it. Thank you. Let's see. Are there rules or guidelines about the room that will take the exam in? For example, an office versus a hotel versus a home room. Um, is there anything we can or cannot have there? The candidate manual will cover that in depth and you'll receive that on Friday. Um, however, we are not dictating where you choose to take the exam. What we would say is that you need to be in a space that you are familiar with. And so that may or may not rule out a hotel room for you. Um, we have had reports of some Wi-Fi issues there. And again, you would have to do the tech check from that location if that's something that you choose to do. Um, we would encourage you to be familiar with that space and um, have it be where you want to take the exam. You've worked so hard to this point. We want you to be in a, a space where you are comfortable. Uh, there's another question about, do you need to take off all wall hangings or posters? You can leave posters that are de-identifying. If you have um, a favorite actor or sports team or something like that, that's certainly allowed. But again, you don't want to have any of your diplomas or any of the things that may allow us to know where you are, where you studied. I think that's an important point to, to make, and thanks for doing that, Dr. Dianus. We don't want to create any possibility that someone may have a preconceived notion about you as a candidate by them knowing where you trained or that kind of information. So that's why we ask you to take down the diplomas. Uh, you just wouldn't want a candidate to say, oh, I see, you I see your diploma, you graduated from um, St. Elsewhere University. Um, and then start talking about something particular about that. So it's increased the fairness of the exam. And so I, I think it just use your common sense on that. There is a question specific to military candidates. Is it expected that they would de-identify de their office from all military awards? They will most likely be in dress uniform for the exam. Is there anything else you would want to add to that one, Dr. Wendell? I think that gets to the same point. You, you just don't want to create um, something that somebody may view differently than you do. Um, so I would say the more uh, bland the, the area, the better. Uh, thank you, sir. There's a question about the presence of books on exam day. Are all books prohibited or just uh, texts related to OBGYN, and the answer to that is um, just the text that could be referred to as a reference during the exam. Um, there can be a, a bookshelf certainly in the room with those leisure books, whatever it is you like to read in your free time. Uh, Mr. Dippenbrock, uh, what happens if we lose power or lose Wi-Fi during the examination? Well, currently we, we try to continue the examination and that's why the, the breaks are in there for 10 minutes instead of one minute or two minutes. Um, if there's a temporary loss of power or signal, um, we'll, uh, I, I guess I'm speaking for Dr. Shivraj at the moment, um, but uh, historically we eat into that time. Um, if it's more than that, then we make other accommodations. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shivraj, what should a candidate do if they feel as though they were treated unfairly or bullied by an examiner? That is one of the reasons we um, try and account for fairness in the model. Um, but if you do feel that way, please email exams at abog.org and we will look into it. Thank you for your question. There's also some more information about that in the candidate bulletin that is posted on the website. Uh, are the examiners traveling to Dallas or will they be remote? Examiners will be traveling to Dallas. And um, the second part of the question is, 
is their consideration if there are IT issues on the side of the examiners. Uh, one of the benefits of having, having the examiners here is that our exemplary IT staff is also on site and can support them through any challenges that they might have. Let's see. If there is a typing mistake in the case list we submitted, is there a way to ask to correct it? Um, at this point, our case lists are closed. Uh, we are not grading them for grammar and spelling, so I think we'll be okay there. Uh, do we need an administrator access to our computer for the exam, or can we use, for example, a university-owned computer? Mr. Diebenbrock, I'll let you take that. Um, that's going to be conditional, um, so you can... Um... It, it will depend if Zoom is already on that computer, and if it is, then you won't have to install it. So you'll be just fine using a um, organization pro provided computer. If not, um, then you probably will need somebody from that help desk to install Zoom for you. I, um, at this point, it's probably unlikely, but um, there is that chance. Thank you, sir. Uh, what if you're taking an exam in an office, in a hospital, and announcements like rapid response codes and calls come over the speaker? I think that would be an unusual situation, but certainly um, we'd let the code pass and uh, continue on with the questioning. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, Mr. Diebenbrock, again, um, there seems to be a preference for external devices. Can you use a laptop with an internal cam? Uh, yes, you can use a laptop with internally embedded uh, peripherals. Um, it's just that external ones tend to have better performance. Um, that's it. Thank you, sir. What happens if the morning of the exam, we find that our internet is not working or we have a power outage? Um, we, again, in the candidates manual, are gonna be providing you with some contact information so that you can make us aware as soon as possible of any challenges that you may be facing in the environment that you're in as you sit for the examination. Uh, ideally, we would reschedule you as soon as possible. And um, if we need to uh, reschedule you that week, that is the ideal. We'll just have to see, and um, that's really kind of a case by case basis. But you will have the contact information to let us know if you're facing those challenges. Dr. Shivraj, my case is 50% of my score or is the actual oral exam what would give the score? Um, that's a great question, and I should have mentioned that the last go around. Given that you have, um, like Dr. Dinas had said, 30 minutes of your um, hour is structured cases, and then 30 minutes of your hour is your case list, we actually do weight the case list while calculating your scores as it goes into the model. So for each section within your OB section, your case list is weighted. Um, equivalent to your structured cases and same within gin or office practice, we're weighting the case list given that it is half of your time of your structured cases. So that's a great question. And I should have mentioned it the last go around. Thanks. Yeah, just to build on that too, we you don't pass or fail sections anymore. And that's a big step forward. Each case is individually graded and the system um, calculates the final scores. And so I, I hope you appreciate that. All of those changes were made to improve the fairness of the exam and to allow you to uh, perform and have a calculated score, not a score determined by the examiners. And then Dr. Shivraj, um, as a follow-up, is the cutoff score always the same or is it set to ensure a certain pass rate? Um, so those are, so the cutoff score is always the same. Uh, we don't always ensure a certain pass rate, but the cutoff score is revisited every couple of years. And it isn't being revisited this year. 
Thank you. Mr. Diebenbrock, we have a couple that are uh, tech related. I am moving between now and when I take the exam, can I still do the tech check if I'm not in the location that I will be taking the exam? We would prefer that you be in the location where you're taking the exam. You do have up until a week before the exam to set your schedule. Hopefully you're settled in by then. Um, if that is not the case, then go ahead and set up a tech check now and email us when you get to your final location so we could do it again. Is it acceptable to take the exam without a headset if we don't own one? Uh, absolutely. We, um, you don't have to have one that was just ideally. Dr. Shivraj, can the examiners tell from our case list if we are fellows? They can. They, it's likely that they can. We do, however, try and account for, not try and account, we do, however, account for examiner severity for those very purposes. And I might add that the content of questions that are, that are asked from reviewing the case list are derived from the blueprint for the specialty exam and not the blueprint for your subspecialty. Would it be recommended to not test in a room that is both an office and a spare bedroom? Would this be seen as unprofessional? Uh, where you choose to take the exam is up to you. We want you to be in a space where you are comfortable and feel like you have the, uh, the operational tools necessary to be successful, whatever that location is for you. I am also going to add that we do specifically train examiners on the fact that candidates are taking it in multiple places. Um, and so specifically on the idea of that, it should not be seen as unprofessional. So we do let them know that. Do you want to mention also that all the examiners undergo unconscious bias training? Uh, and that is a requirement uh, that we introduced several years ago that's been very helpful to make sure that these kind of things don't happen. Yes, and as Dr. Wendell said, uh, the, is Sunday prior to the exam, all examiners do go through a standardized unconscious bias training for that very specific purpose for where candidates take the exam. The question that was asked prior about um, uh, whether they can identify case lists being from fellowship, et cetera, so that they are not able to um, provide any sort of bias on the exam. Okay, Mr. Diebenbrock, for a little bit of a deeper answer, what happens if the morning of the exam, we find out our internet is not working or there is a power outage prior to the start of the exam? As Dr. Dinah said, just contact us using the information that we're going to send out later. Um, we will have somebody from our IT team help work through any issues that we can. Um, if it's something that we cannot address and cannot remediate prior to the exam, um, there will be some accommodation made. I don't know, you know what will be available at that time, but um, it, I, I feel like this question's come up a, a few times. It's not you're not going to fail the exam due to a technical issue. Um, we will make accommodations in some form. And I'll just add, we do have experience with this, giving over 2,000 oral exams a year, and um, most of them with candidates being remote for the last year and a half or two years. Uh, these do happen. It's not the end of the world, and we will make things right and try to help you get certified as quickly as you can. That's our goal, is to partner with you as you're going through the process. And so if it happens, um, please contact us, as, as was stated, so we can help um, complete the exam or reschedule things based on what's happening. We've had hurricanes, we've had tornadoes, we've had power outages. 
we've had buildings next door with the uh, power line cut. Um, things happen and we're here to help you and we wanna help you through it. Dr. Hoffman, if you could lend your expertise to uh, this question for candidates in fellowship with case lists somewhat unique to fellowship. Do you have any guidance for how we can discuss our practice setting and colleagues slash referral practices without sharing identifying information about the practice? Sure. And I, and I think this question may have been typed before I had a chance to, to type the other one, but the content that you will be questioned on is not content germane to your fellowship, but questions and um, content will derive from or circle back from the specialist blueprint of content that we feel uh, certified specialists should have mastered, not a certified subspecialist should have mastered. It's certainly okay to mention if you are asked or if the, it comes up in the management that you're in a, a postgraduate fellowship training program, if that's part of the question. You don't have to hide that information um, and pretend you're in a general practice. Um, you can provide the context in which you manage the patients. They may ask, how would that patient have been managed by someone in a different situation who is in a, a different setting than the one that you're working in. As Dr. Hoffman said, it's the material that will be assessed and the content and the practice uh, more than your specific practice in some cases. There's a question about when will we find out regarding our examiners and what determines if there's a conflict. Uh, the morning of or the afternoon of your exam, part of that check-in process is to identify whether there is a con whether there is a conflict between you and any of the examiners you will be working with the, that day, and um, AVOG is prepared to substitute an examiner if we need to do that. Dr. Hoffman, is there anything you wanted to say about that? It looked like maybe you had something to say. No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Are the exams being recorded to review content or conflicts? No, the exams are not recorded. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned that they joined late. We promise we are working to make this available to you. You'll have one copy of it today and another copy of it later this week. Uh, is there any information available as to whether exams will stay remote for upcoming years? Uh, I think our focus today is really on the 2022 certifying exam. I would ask any of my colleagues if they want to share any additional information. No, I would just say the, the, the scheduling and delivery of the exams is a very complicated process and we'll continue to evaluate that on an ongoing basis. We have a plan to have the subspecialty exams in April in 2023 in Dallas. Um, and we'll be moving forward with those plans. Um, there are clearly are accommodations that we have to make and some potential um, complications that come up with remote exams. And some of you will, will experience those in different settings. There are things called, uh, that are very sophisticated psychometric things that come into play that can affect scores yeah, for people in different settings. And I won't go into those, but Dr. Shivraj could give you a talk on that all day long. And some people, it, it affects them adversely. And some people have actually canceled their exams because they don't want to give, don't want to take the exam uh, remotely on a computer. And it, it's more than you would think. Uh, so this is a very complicated and important decision. Uh, we want to be your partner in helping you move to the next stage of your professional career and we want to do it fairly um, and what's in the best interest of the exam process and, and you as candidates. So it's something we will continually discuss as we move forward. Dr. Shivraj, there are two that kind of go hand in hand. Will the score report be clear with pass-fail status or how will that be presented in the results report if there is no pass or fail? Um, no, it will be clearly presented in the 
school report. So your first page of your school report tells you your name and your whether or not you passed or failed. It will give you a, a distribution graph of where all the candidates are, a score distribution graph, what the cut score is on the exam, as well as where you lie in relation to the um, passing score. So if you fail, whether you're below the cut score or if you pass, whether you're above the cut score. So it will clearly show you where you are in relation to the passing score. So it will give you up top whether you passed and the distribution and where you are in relation to the um, passing score. And then the next few pages will actually break it down by um, each section and how you did on each section. So the school reports will be pretty clear on that. And then with the implementation of the new model, how have those changes affected the pass rate? I know you covered this a little bit, but I think we have an, some additional clarity. Yes, aggregate pass rates have not changed over time. Our pass rates have been posted on our ABOG website, and you can find them there. And I would just like to highlight that one other important thing that Dr. Hoffman and Shivraj and their teams have done is evaluate the pass rates um, during the time of COVID. Um, and do you want to talk about those, Dr. Shivraj? Our specialty is quite unique in that, in the performance of, of folks like you. And I think that should be some reassurance. Yes, we have seen a, um, pass rates have not been affected in our specialty, um, which is a pretty good thing that we saw. So, um, yeah. Do you have anything else to add, Dr. Wendell, to that? Just to mention, some of the other specialties have seen drops in their qualifying exam aggregate performance, as well as their certifying exams. And I think we're proud to, to say that your programs, your faculty, and you all have worked incredibly hard, and that has not happened in our specialty. The, the no development of the knowledge, judgment, and skills to give great care to the women of America has not been affected uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so congratulations to you all for your dedication and hard work. Mr. Diepenbrock, um, are we sharing our screen during the Zoom? What will be displayed? The candidates will not be sharing their screen. Um, it'll just be, you'll just be consuming a Zoom meeting like you are now. Um, that's it. the The application and things will be pumped over that that Zoom connection. And then, um, thank you. Is there a specific time of day that tech checks can be done? For example, are, is there any availability after five p.m.? Uh, there should be. Um, I will get the answer to Dr. Dynas, and she will put that in the uh, communications that we uh, have going forward. I'm actually doing uh, my training with the tech check technicians immediately after this meeting. So um, I will get her an answer and, and get that out that way. Um, but you'll be making it just like uh, you'll get a link to Calendly and get on somebody's. Um, Outlook calendar, and um, it'll be done all times a day, all throughout the week. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hoffman, I work in a low resource setting, and the interventions I was able to provide, tests, surgeries, medications, et cetera, reflect the limited resources where I practice. How will my case list be graded? Certainly, we examine on the full scope of care um, for a given condition, um, knowing the limitations for your area um, is important, but then also knowing the other options, even though they may not be available to you, knowing what other options, benefits, risks are, are possible are important um, just to uh, provide patients with appropriate counseling and option discussions. Thank I you. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, when will we find out which time frame, morning or afternoon sessions we will be examined in as it is important due to the time change and choosing location to take our exam? 
assuming likely when we get our exact exam date, but I want to confirm. Um, so the, the short answer to that is that we are working to get that information out six weeks ahead of your exam date. Um, at the at the latest, it will be four weeks ahead of time. We're working on um, a pretty tight timeline and want to get that information to you as soon as possible for all of the reasons that you've articulated. Let's see, I think this one. Oh, see, this one goes to you, Dr. Hoffman. Along the same lines, should we pretend that we do not do certain things that are beyond the scope of general practice, or is it okay to say what we actually do during the exam? Certainly, if you're a, spe a specialist, let's say in FPMR and S, and um, would manage a particular patient with a procedure that perhaps a specialist doesn't have mastery of, certainly um, I wouldn't alter your answer as long as it's a medically appropriate and recognized treatment. Thank you. Are we expected to reference our printed case list during the examination or rely on projected shared case presentation? You will have your de-identified printed case list with you as a reference. Um, the examiner will share with you specifics to the case list they are referencing on your exam screen. Is there anything anyone else would want to add to that? Thank you. Um, what if a pet enters the room? Will we be allowed to get up and remove the animal? Um, <laughs> we realize that this, these are unusual times and um, I think it's been stated before by members of the panel. Uh, we understand that we are uh, testing in unusual situations and things may happen obviously if your pet walks into the room, it's probably best practice to get up very quickly and exit them out and shut the door so that that doesn't happen again. We want you to have um, an, un an un uninterrupted experience. Um, would one of my colleagues like to speak to what specifically accounts as a conflict with examiners? I'm happy to address that. There'll be um, instructions given about what constitutes a conflict. Um, it's generally uh, someone who trained you. Uh, it's, there are some geographic um, conflicts, someone who's a friend. Um, in general, we will have taken care of most of those conflicts beforehand by asking the examiners if there's a potential conflict. Uh, but things like being in a med school, going to med school, um, are not considered conflicts in most cases. Um, being on ACOG committees, uh, being on professional society committees, uh, study sections, NIH groups, and things like that are that are more professional acquaintances um, typically are not considered um, conflicts. But if you think it's a conflict, um, then certainly when you're asked, you can report it and we'll try to work through it um, as best we can. We don't want you to feel like there's any uh, conscious or subconscious bias in anybody who's examining you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Wendell, whoever would like to answer this one. How many cases are in each part of each section, i.e. three cases for the case list in OB, three structured cases in OB, et cetera? So on the structured cases, um, there are um, five cases um, in gynecology, five cases in OB, five cases in office practice. Each case has three different screens, um, and that's the structure for the structured cases. For your case list, we try to cover um, between eight and 10 topics on your case list, again, to allow you the opportunity to 
um, display your mastery of the content that's on the exam blueprint. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Shivraj, if we have an invisible disability, uh, a stutter, anxiety, et cetera, is this able to be factored into the psychometric scoring? No, it's not factored into the psychometric scoring. It, we train examiners on bias um, and then so we train examiners on bias in a nutshell, but it's not necessarily factored into scoring in any sort of way. We assume um, that the training by itself takes care of that. And then the factoring into uh, taking into account the severity score would also account for that, but disabilities don't get taken into account in terms of scoring. I would just remind you what Dr. Dinas said before, if, if there are any requests for accommodations um, under the ADA um, regs, we're, we're happy to look into those. And uh, it is sort of a new world of having accommodations for a remote exam, because most exams are given in a standardized setting, in a, uh, either in a, an oral setting or in a test center. So if you have, questions about that, we have support staff that are ready to talk to you at any time um, and can help you. We want you to be able to display your knowledge, skills, and abilities as best you can. And if there's something we can do to help with that, we're happy to try to make an accommodation. Thank you, Dr. Wendell. Uh, we have, we're getting close to the end of our webinar, but we've got a couple more questions I want to hit, and then um, we will again, generate an FAQ list with answers to all of these questions for you. Um, Dr. Hoffman, what if you don't get through all five structured cases? Is that counted against you? Um, we want to be able to grade you on your answers and management of the patients presented. And so part of examiner training is time management. And so you may uh, encounter a situation where your examiner says, well, we, uh, we need to move on. And that gives you an opportunity to cover all of the cases during the structured cases. So if an examiner interrupts and says, um, thank you for your answer in the interest of time, we need to move on, it's to give you the opportunity to demonstrate your mastery of the knowledge on all five structured cases. And then finally, there's a question about whether you can use a pad and paper or a whiteboard to demonstrate things to the examiners during the test. The answer is you can absolutely use a whiteboard to demonstrate your knowledge uh, as part of the assessment process. I realize that we still have a couple of questions in the chat, but we're in the Q&A. We will generate answers for those and provide them to you at the end of the week. In the meantime, everyone can expect a recording this afternoon of this webinar to give you that high level overview and what you can expect in the coming weeks as we all prepare for the remote administration of the 2022 certifying examination. Uh, the ABOG staff is working hard to support you, and we want to see you have all the tools necessary to be successful in this administration. Thank you for your time, and be looking for those emails. In the meantime, if you need anything, please email exams at abog.org. We are here to assist you. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>